we on? Oh, we're on. Yeah. So, meet Guy Alleywood, because we've just been discussing, like, how do you pronounce your surname? How do you I'm pronounce I'm going to struggle it? now. <laughs> That's my name. All right, here we go. Um, Guy Alleywood. 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 Yeah, let's go with that. All right, Alleywood. Yeah. yeah, well, I like that. It's a new year. Let's do it. So, um, we're just talking uh, very briefly right then about your heritage. Yeah. <laughs> so is that Egyptian and al Aboriginal? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> what an amazing... How did that happen? Well, we can go to the yeah. background of that, yeah. yeah. Well, Mum and Dad got together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, how did that all happen? That's how Where did they meet? Where did they meet? Do you know all that? Yeah, in addiction, actually. In addiction? Yeah. So that's how they actually met and had... Oh, wow. Yeah. Because we're talking tonight... Um, in relation to Guy's life, because we were saying that he was actually born in the rehab centre where his parents went. So, um, tell me about their life and how that all happened, because then we'll get to you and okay. All right. So, yeah. Because I mean, this is a really intense story, and I think there's a lot of young people out there who perhaps maybe now are dealing with this situation where their parents are both addicts and yep. they're in that lifestyle, yep. you know, and, and this is a perfect example of how your life went and where you are right now. So let's just talk about your parents getting together okay. and what life was like back then for them. All right. Okay. Well, so the story goes, <laughs> um, they met in the eighties. I think around 1980 um, and that was through my father was actually a heroin dealer and my mum was new to the scene um, it's becoming a heroin well, was a heroin addict at the time and um, so my mum was drawn to my father through you know drugs, yeah. through drugs and um, yeah and they lived in Sydney they lived in Seven Hills from what I remember in Blacktown and um, yeah, they, they were pretty adventurous, you know, and they were, they'd done a lot of crime and stuff. And so that kind of, you know, how they met and that's what bonded them together from the very start, you know. And I guess um, from, what I, from what I heard and on reflection, it, it was out of desperation, you know. And they were both really desperate and broken and, um, you know, some of their past issues brought them together, you know, because they could relate with that stuff. Yeah. And that's what normally does happen because right. they're attracted to each other because they're living yeah. the same life. Yeah. And, you know, anyone that's straight and out there is, just doesn't fit in with that situation. Definitely. So, um, are you an only child? I have a sister. One sister. Yeah. So, to the same parents? Yep. And what happened in her life? Did she venture into that situation as well? Yeah, look, she, um, she, uh, she ended up in addiction. She's still... She's still there, you know, she's somewhat better, um, but she's still, yeah, in addiction at, as we speak now, so. Well, that's really sad. Yeah. So for a whole lifetime, is that? No, well, she was so, she kind of held off and she always, you know, told me when I started using, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to use and I'm going to be there for you. And, um, yeah, so when she was about 14, she, uh, yeah, she... Found drugs, you know, started smoking pot and then, you know, ventured off into ice and she was um, an ice dealer and, um, but now she's more heroin, methadone, um, she's on a maintenance program and stuff like that now and um, still struggles with it today, so, but she's been through a lot, so. Um, so how do you feel about that knowing that you've gone through a life of addiction? Yeah. And you're unable to help your sister? How, do you, how does that make you feel, all of that? Well, I think through my experience in, in being in recovery over almost 10 years now is, um, you know, I, I can love my sister and I can support her and be there f for her basically by doing what I'm doing, you know, and, um, mm. you know, and I've learned over the years because I have been through a period, you know, I think for around the first five years I tried to save her, you know, because I desperately wanted her to be in this life, you know, and she always used to say to me, and she probably still does today, is, um, you know, you're a lot worse than what I was, you know, and if you can do it, I can do it, you know, and so, so basically every day that I'm still clean, you know, the, the you know, 
it's like an example for her, yeah. you know, mm, and, mm. and she, you know, when she is ready, um, I'm definitely there for her. Is she younger or older than She's you? She's younger. So we'll go right back there to where you were born. Yes. <laughs> so your parents were in a rehab centre. Yes. So, yes. Wow, this is just insane, isn't it? Like, really, when you think about it, like where you, where you first started. Mm. They're both in the rehab centre, your mum's giving birth and... Yeah. Wow. So that was life for you at that stage. And yeah. how does that work when someone's an addict and they're in a rehab centre and they give birth? What happens to that baby? Well, well, I, like, I guess I'd, I'd bring it back a little bit because what happened... Um, my, my mother um, and father uh, had... Well, she gave... You know, birth to me in a hospital, and um, there were really strict bowel conditions. And um, story was that Mum sort of had me. You know, when she was she was very sick. She was you know um, hanging out, you know, needing more heroin, and uh, she stole a lot of things from the hospital and tried to leave. You know, and at the same time, my dad was part of that somehow. And what the story was is they both got arrested. You know, and basically taken to the courthouse. And back then in the 80s, from what I was told, is um, there was actually someone present that worked in the rehab that sat in the courthouse that gave people the option, you know, to go into that particular rehab. And, um, you know, the judge basically said on that day, either I lock you up or you just go with this person and you go in the rehab and you can take your kid. So they chose to... Uh, go to rehab and then take me along with them. <laughs> so that was the option? That was the option. So you lived you lived in the rehab centre? Yeah, yeah. Wow, so how does that work? Like, so for how long were you in that rehab centre? So back then it was, I think it was around about 18 months, two year program, you know, depending on where you were in the program and you know, what effort you put in and it was a really strict program um, compared to what it is today. But um, uh, so from my understanding, we, well, I lived there for the first, say, roughly two years, and um, my dad completed the program. He went away into a transitional phase with that program and then returned back to the rehab sometime later and was a staff member in the rehab. And uh, so basically I was there for about 18 months, two years, left for a little bit and then come back. And... Um, my mum completed the program, she took a little bit longer, um, story was she, was she was a bit more stubborn and there was a, there was a, you know, a lot for her to sort of work through. Um, yeah, and then for the next, I think till I was about six, um, we followed the rehab around. So I basically lived with the rehab for a period of time, you know, when I was, you know, up to about 18 months to two years and then went back and, um, that's when the rehab moved from Galvin uh, to Rathmines in, in Newcastle. And um, but look, I I have a lot of really great memories. You know, it was you know there was a lot of I used to attend a lot of meetings, and you know I remember certain times where you know I must have been around you know three or something, and and I used to ride my little truck, and back then there was like a hundred. 100 residents or something like that, you know, and I used to ride my little truck and, and wake up all the residents, you know, <laughs> in this particular the setting that we're in and, um, yeah, and of course there was other kids there because back then you could have your kids there, that was Oh, so how many other kids were there? I couldn't, look, what I remember and what the photos that I do have, you know, is there's roughly about 10 or 15 kids. Wow. From what I've seen, yeah. unbelievable. And this was a farm setting in Goldburn yeah. and, um, you know, it had... A big cafe. It had lots of different things of what I can remember is my childhood. So, um, yeah, I, I've got some really great memories of, of growing up in the rehab, but, um, yeah, little did I know where, what that was, <laughs> you know. Yeah, back then then, was, way back then it was home to you. That's right, yeah. So then, um, so did your father and mother stay off the drugs after the rehab? Yeah, I... And look, that, that story's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. um, what I do know is my father did stay clean, but what I do know also is um, when my mother went into the transitional phase, um, she used with me. Um, and 
yeah, had had a relapse, and, and my dad kind of saved that and held that all together. You know, my dad's a pretty strong man, and um, yeah, he uh, he done his best, you know, and um, obviously, mum, you know, got back, you know, into the rooms and done the suggested things that she needed to do, and um, you know, uh, she stayed clean for a couple of years after that. So the story. So ends. when you said just then, I picked up on that that she used with me. Yeah. So, how old were you? So I'm pretty sure around then I was around three, two, two and a half. I, I was a baby, so that, that story was told to me. So when I got in recovery, I, I actually listened <laughs> to yeah. my father. You know, funny thing that. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's where he just, I remember this, you know, I think the first year of my, my recovery was like, Dad, just filling me in with everything, you know. And, and one of the stories was, you know, we were um, in this house and then mum used took off with me, you know, because dad was at work and, and used with me in the car and um, then they, I think they were um, discharged from that transitional house, lived in a caravan and um, so she had a relapse, so she used for a period of time, it wasn't just a lapse and um, uh, yeah, it almost broke my mum and dad up back then but um, yeah, for some reason I guess. Are they still together today? No, no. So, looking back to where you were back then, so living through that, did you feel that I'm never going to do that? Or was it more like you felt that that was the norm? Oh, look, I think, like, the norm for me growing up till I was about nine was attending meetings with my father. Um, Mum was a bit crazy, she owned a lot of plants and a lot of jewellery and you know, she was a bit obsessive, <laughs> you know, she didn't attend meetings, but um, uh, look, I, I had a really adventurous, you know, living with rehab for the first more or less six years of my life, there was a lot of great memories, you know, and, uh, you know, and there was a lot of coffee and smoking and everything that was surrounded me, but, um, you know, I never thought much of it, I didn't even know what that was, and um, the story was... And from what I can recall was when I was around nine, um, my mum's a singer, so she got right back into the singing uh, career and um, she relapsed again, you know, and that ultimately uh, separated my parents. My dad, you know, he chose to leave, you know, he chose his recovery, you know, all the way back then. And, um, but yeah, I, I definitely say to answer your question, I think from nine <coughs> till I was about... 11, I did, you know, have this strong desire and passion that, you know, basically, I'm not going to be like you because this is what you've caused, you know. So I had resentments back then towards my mum um, because she broke up the family and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and what I could see, you know, and, um, you know, and there was many, you know, going from a household that never had alcohol or drugs to now there's there's a lot of drugs and alcohol and, um, and a lot of different people coming through the house. It was, as you can imagine, that I, you know, I went through a lot, you know, through that, and um, but yeah, I did have this strong sense that you know I'm not going to be like you, mum, and um, yeah. Because... But that all changed when you were how old did you first start with drugs? What was your first day of or first um, situation? All right, so the first situation that I can remember um, was roughly around eleven, and. Um, you know, mum was, was drinking and, and all the rest of it. And what I'd done, you know, because this is after about two years of, you know, trying to survive in that kind of atmosphere. And um, I, uh, I I had this tendency to kind of run away, you know, and uh, or go to friends' houses where they were a bit, you know, sane and it was a, it was a little bit, you know, um, somewhat normal. And um, I remember this particular time I, I took alcohol out of the fridge and um, I went over to my friends and we were in a caravan and, and we had a drink and, and um, we got drunk, it tasted like crap. <laughs> um, I wasn't really a big fan of the taste of alcohol. And, no. um, that was my first experience. Um, and then, from what I can recall, around 12 is when uh, I smoked pot for the first time. and. Um, 
that was behind my mum's back because you know I was still in the alcohol and then it, it you know it got to the pot because my mum was growing plants and that as well and um, and I remember having some cones with the same friends and um, I didn't like it <laughs> I went into a trance I think, I think I got a bit too stoned or something but I yeah it took me away but it took me too far away back then <laughs> it, was, it was apparently it was really good stuff <laughs> I know it's no laughing matter here, but yeah. we are trying to make light of the whole situation. Yeah, I'll definitely... Because um, it's important, isn't it? Because, yeah. I mean, we could all sit around, be morbid and, and you know, shedding the tears. But mm. you've got to lighten things up a little just to get through it, haven't you, really? I've done a lot of healing over that yeah. stuff and a lot of yeah. acceptance of, you know, it's my story. And um, it's definitely, uh, you know, it's my experience and it, and it is an asset. It's not a burden today. So, um... Yeah, because of your situation and what you went through, That's right. you were able to work with people that have gone through it themselves. Yeah, definitely. So you ended up getting into drugs yourself. Yes. <clears throat> and life was pretty um, full on, full of crime. How would you describe your teen years? Oh, look. I, it's... Like, what was your day like? All right, all right. So we'll put it this way. So... Because it kind of goes really well with this, with you know my experience, and I think it's important to probably share this. Is um, you know I didn't want to be like my mum, but what I did want was to have a connection with her, you know. And I had this sense of I needed a sense of belonging, you know. Mm. And um, you know, so when I smoked pot that first time, and then she found out, she said, you know, you, you smoke pot with me, and that that's fine. At least you're not doing it anywhere else. And so that was the first time that that I formed, you know, mum took an interest in me. Ah, so you, know. you had that instant connection. That's right, and we had something similar. Yeah yeah, 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 and, um, yeah, and, look, that, that was around 13, 12, 13, before I hit 13, actually, and, um, you know, from that day forward, I thought, my mum is the cause, you know, she is definitely... There, you know, so my perspective changed from, you know, being really resentful against her instead of, you know, doing that, going to just basically following suit and, and you know, feeling a part of something, even though it was something that, you know, six months prior, I thought, you know, I never want to do this with my life. And, um, but yeah, let's just say for the first fair few years, it was exciting. Um, I felt privileged. I felt like I belonged. Um... It was up, it was down, it was, you know, like my role models were, you know, people, you're moving forward, uh, you know, a fair bit. It was people coming out of jail and um, they used to come and live with us, you know, because my mum at that stage owned a big house and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, I used to see, um, I remember this one bloke, um, you know, can I be really honest with that? Absolutely, yeah. that's what it's all about. All right. So I remember this one bloke being thing. out there and <coughs> honest and upfront. Well, see, I remember this one bloke, and this was before I um, used any type of opiate. Heroin was most my first opiate, um, and uh, yeah, there was this one bloke, and you know, I formed a connection with my mum through you know smoking pot, you know, and then snorting speed and stuff like that back then, and. And then I remember this one bloke and it just, I, I, I have the image, like I have the footage in my memory now, it's there, you know, I, I aspired to be this bloke. He got out of jail, he had guns, he, he had, you know, gold, he, he, people feared him, tattoos, he'd done a lot of jail and, you know, and I remember this particular moment, he was walking up the back end of our house in the hallway and he was injecting uh, methadone back then. And... Uh, I've seen that and I've seen how that looked and I thought, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, that, that really appeals to me, you know, I want to be like you, you know, and, and it's the same thing, like talking about it now is, you know, wanting to, be, you know, wanting a sense of acceptance or belonging in some area, you know, because, you know, I really like that and, um, but yeah, I like, I've seen that, you know, and, um, yeah, so I, yeah, my mum had a thing back then, before I started doing the same as what he he was doing. Um, you know, look, you you can do all that. You know, you can snort speed, you can drink alcohol, you can you know smoke pot with me and everything, but you're not shooting up. You know, and um, 
but when I seen this bloke, it was something that I, you know, that I, I wanted to do, you know, and um, because that was like you're in business, you know what I mean? Mm. You, you, you're part of that. You, you, you're in the the next level. Next level. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, you know, and even before all that happened, you know, I used to, you know, um, used to wag school and all the rest of it, and you know, and just come home and bring a whole lot of friends home, you know, and. Um, and you yeah. were probably the cool kid, were you? That's right. <laughs> mm. so, you know, I, I struggled to get a sandwich made for school, but I tell you now, I could take you know a fair bit of pot and and sell a fair bit of pot and smokes and everything and and, mm. and survive that way. So you buy know. the sandwiches. Yeah, 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 I would. Yeah, I'd get more than sandwiches. I would. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, so um, yeah, you know, and it was all in reflection. It was just about surviving, you know, and, and doing the best with the tools I had back then. Um, yeah. So what? Well, what stage did you get to? So you're on heroin. Yep. How old are you when you thought that you've got to do something about this to change your life? So, twenty five. So twenty five. So how many years is that that you're on? So I was on. I was on everything for about sixteen years. Wow. Yeah. It's just amazing that you actually made that conscious decision to do something about it that you didn't get lost in it you know where 30 years have passed by mm. which a lot of people do like because every day just molds into the next That's right. and they get lost with where they are and before they know it they're this age and so what what went click in your mind to make you do something different look I think so I have to say that something clicked. What it was, what, you know, I'm reflecting was like divine intervention. <laughs> you mm. know, and, and let's say if being clicked, you know, I, what what had come what come to me was, um, you know, I went to rehab when I was 25. So I, I was in rehab at 16. <clears throat> so I was basically so I'd done a lot of juvie and a lot of jail and 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 you know I was on the methadone for around about eight years. Um, it's one of the first people in the Central Coast region when I was 16 to actually be prescribed that medication. Wow, so 16 you're on methadone? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I just think you're so amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're just amazing. Like, it's just, wow, sorry, so I'm interrupting again, but I'm sorry. just really taken by this whole situation. Yeah. So, 16 on methadone. So when were you clean? How old were you when you were, you were clean? So the first time I got clean was when I was 25. 25. So yeah. I got off the methadone in jail. Um, I was bailed, but the condition was that you had to um, be abstinent, you know, from medication and everything. So, um, you know, it took me about, oh, yeah, I think it took me about three months in jail to get, to get off the methadone because I've been on that for quite some time. And... Um, I got off that and I entered this rehab three month program and um, you know and I remember even back then it was the first time that you know had been for so long where I experienced you know to laugh and have an adventure you know go camping and you know it was a really simple program that one and um, you know one of the clear messages that they gave me was uh, you know if you do have a problem with, with drugs, you know, more or less alcohol is going to be the same issue, you know, it will lead you back, it's in the same boat, you know, and um, I definitely turned up to that that uh, front door of the rehab knowing that I had a problem with drugs. You know, I've got a lengthy history, criminal history, and all as a result of, you know, you know, supplying my habit, you know, I had to, you know, it was a pretty high demand, you know, um, being on heroin and methadone and all the rest of it, and, um, you know, one of the clear messages they said to me, you know, if you think that you can leave here and drink, you know, this is something that's going to lead you back. You know, but um, I wasn't ready. <laughs> so I'd done the three-month program and I went to a, to a wake, or I went to a funeral of a friend that died from from uh, amphetamines back then. And um, and within, oh, I think it was about three hours of, after leaving, I, I had a drink. You know, and um, I can pinpoint the moment that I was I was at that bar and everyone was having fun and I'm having a drink and you know I'm feeling a bit tipsy and I and I thought you know what this is taking too long you know <laughs> you know and on the phone I was and um, 
within, I don't know, an hour or two, you know, I'm back on it. Um, but that was the first time, you know, other than when I was in rehab when I was 16, you know, I, I left, I got out of juvie and they basically escorted me front, to the front door and, um, yeah, here you go, take him. And that was, see, that was identified. So the thing that went in my favour, you know, back then is that I had a really lengthy history with, you know, a lot of charges. Like I, but what also happened is I was um, removed from my, from my mother because there was a lot of abuse and, you know, different types of things that happened when, you know, that type of atmosphere, because my mum, you know, it was a lot of things, you know, and it was, it was a pretty heavy household. And, um, uh, but what they did do is any judge that I went in front of, they felt really sorry for me. You know, it's like this little fella hasn't had a go, he hasn't had a, you know, we really want to help him. So they even identified that at 16, mm. you know, and I went into rehab and I think I lasted not even two weeks the first time. Um, and then at 25, I went in and, um, like I said, I was, you know, wasn't ready. And um, went out there and it was like, but I went out there, I said, 25, with a head full of uh, recovery and meetings and 12 steps. And, and, and it just changed because prior to that, I didn't really know nothing different. You know, it mm. was all, you know, I never done anything, you know. I hadn't had a license, a job. Um, you know, the only thing I've really done was crime, drugs, you know, uh, juvie, jail, and lived on the streets. You know, that was my life. You know, it was my life, so, um, yeah, like I went, I went back out there for two years, uh, from 25, and uh, wasn't the same. You know, I thought, you know, I'm just going to use, back then it was speed, you know, and then ice come on the scene. Um, you know, it was around, but they used to call it something different, but, um, yeah, and I, I thought, yeah, I was so adamant, I'm just going to use amphetamines, <coughs> you know, and, and smoke pot, that's it. And before you knew it, before I know it, you know, I think it was about two weeks. And then, you know, I combine a little bit of heroin, you know, and then I, then I get a habit, and then I'm doing crime. And it's straight back into what I know best. And, um, so back to your question. <laughs> what wow. clicked? Yeah, what? <clears throat> so what clicked for me is experiencing two years out there, um, you know, I knew there was another life, there was another side to being, you know, an adult, let's say, <laughs> and mm. um, I knew that I could live and, and not have this restriction where, you know, I was basically a zombie. I had to go and do things to feel okay, you know, and feel just, you know, I don't think I was getting, you know, you get to a stage where you don't even feel like the stone, it's not happening, you know, you're just doing it not to feel sick and um, to get up and to go to sleep and say, I need drugs, you know, do all, all these different things and... Um, yeah, so two years out there and, and a lot of crime and uh, what happened was, um, which is always the case, you know, I ever get locked up, you know, I don't, I'm not one that goes, you know what, I've had enough, I'm just going to, you know, throw the, the flag up and go, you know, help me. I was never really humble enough to do that, I guess, but, um, you know, at 27, I was, um, so in January 2010, I had a task force after me. So what I... Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, it was... I know we can laugh now, but way back then. Yeah. Look, I, and that was all, you know, I'm not really that calculated, you know, I'm not really kind of calculated criminal, you know, I'm mm. kind of just a spontaneous, you know, you know, do whatever I do to get, to get whatever I get. And, um, you know, I come in possession of, you know... Uh, a detective's gun and his badge and all his identity and his laptop and the whole caboodle. Wow. Yeah. Did you get to use it? Well, no. <laughs> no, yeah. See? Oh, <laughs> no, see, yeah. I'm just inquisitive. <laughs> no, see, when I got that, so I, I'm, a, I'm more of a, I was never really a, a violent person. You know, I, I've been around a lot of violence and, you know, I survived in jail, you know, and, um, you know, I, I could have a go and, and, you know, but I was never really, didn't have that, that, that in me, as much as I wanted to be like this big, you know, it wasn't there, but, um, you know, I'm more about, you know, I get stuff and I got good fences and I'm selling it and I know a lot of people to offload a lot of things to. So I'm really well connected because what went in my favour in that world is my mum was a pretty, you know, she was a dealer, she owned a brothel, she, she done a lot of things, you know, and, um, she was really connected. Um, but yeah, back to the, the little, the little, um, 
story around the gun and everything is uh, I had it sold. So I had, for the, for the gun and badge alone, I had 10 grand, you know. And, yeah. But I, I had to wait for, for a certain time. And um, what brought me undone, which was a blessing in disguise now, is um, I went to my mother's house. You know, my mum's always been a dealer. And uh, I went there with my sister. And um, I was hanging out and I, and I was waiting to, to get on. And um, I went there and we had some speed. And, and uh, I went... Um, and this was after I'd done the urn that I'd done to get these things and and I was in her lounge room and she's got cameras and all the rest of it and uh, she she wanted this gun you know and uh, she's pretty adamant that you know her and her partner wanted this gun you know and I wouldn't sell it up because I had what I had for it you know and um, but what I did do there is uh, I ripped up all the ID and stuff from, from the detective's wallet and put it in the bin and I gave, I gave him a bullet, the hollow point bullets that were in this gun and um, yeah, I, I left there, you know, my mum was pretty, because I, I stole a gun off her when I was younger, you know, so that was her thing, you owe me a gun, you know, you need to, yeah, but I didn't want to do that and I left there and it was down the central coast and within a matter of getting dropped off at the shopping centre, 20 minutes later, um, 20 minutes, half an hour later, my sister rings me and says, they're after you. They know the, the, the coppers are after you. And I'm like, what do you mean they're after me? I, I, I walk lives. I, sweet, how do they know? And she just said, look, mum's given you up and a boyfriend. They've gone to the cop shop. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was. But like I said, it was a blessing in disguise. That's right. That's because right. Because that changed your whole life. Yeah. Well, well, exactly right, you know. And, um, and I remember exactly where I was. I was at this particular shopping centre down the Central Coast and got that off, you know, and I just went into survival mode. I went and I buried the gun in the batch. I already sold the laptop and I, and I sold it. It was a tag here, a watch and, you know, a couple of other little things and um, uh, buried them out in the swamp, out the back of this shopping centre. I went in and got a high vis shirt and basically walked out and there was just a row of, um, basically, there was, there was D's, there was paddy wagons and they were coming in this particular shopping centre and I just jumped straight in the cab. And yeah, straight to the Tugger train station, and uh, off I was on the run. I've been on the run a lot of times, you know, but this was probably one of the better ones. And um, <laughs> one of the yeah, better ones. <laughs> yeah, this was yeah, this was a good. I've, oh, yeah, do you feel a, like you're just talking about someone else, like it's a movie that you've been watching. Uh, like, just no, nah, I think for me, I get this sense of like uh, an adrenaline. Yeah, thing. like yeah, yeah there's this sense of adrenaline and. I'm a pretty adventurous type of person, you know, and, and that was a kind of an adventure for me, but, you know, I was, I was always, you know, in the later, later years of using was, you know, there was two things. I didn't want to go to jail and I needed to get on, <laughs> you know, and that was basically, you know, so I, you know, so that's what I'd done for, I think I was on the run for around, oh, I think it was around 10 days. So I had, they, they deployed a certain task force, you know, for, for me. Because the detective that I that, that owned all this stuff is pretty high up, and there was some pretty classified information, you know, on the laptop that I sold as well. Oh wow! Yeah, there were a lot of investigations that were going on. But plus, I had a firearm that you know mm. that um, when I got it wasn't locked up properly <laughs> in this particular area that I got it from. So you know that fell back on the detective, uh, I would imagine. <laughs> So, um, yeah, 10 days, you know, and, and like what you see on TV, they just went from everywhere that, you know, that I went. And at this time, I had a fight with the partner that I was with, and, you know, so, you know, that was prior to me getting this stuff, you know, that was part of the story too. So I was basically, you know, I was really codependent, and I had three kids with this particular girl, and been with her for 12 years, you know, she was, you know, same stuff that brought my parents together, you know, we got together through misery and pain, and... And drugs, you know, really connected to us, but that's a different story. But yeah. Um, so what yeah. was it? What was that like when they actually caught you? How they catch you? It's great. So what happened? Great. <laughs> it's <was> great. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so where I ended up is I got the clear that this house was okay, which was my sister's house, and I just needed somewhere to go. You know, I was had nowhere to go, and I just wanted to go somewhere, smoke a couple of cones, just have half an hour <clears throat> to just reset. You know, because um, they were just going everywhere. It was closing in on me, and I felt it. And um, I was at my sister's house in uh, New Lambton, 
and um, I just hopped off the phone and I was fighting with the ex and um, my phone rang, I gave it to my sister and I was in a garage and um, uh, she's hopped on the phone and she says, no detective, he's not here, you know, and I'm listening to her and there's a garage door there and I'm, I'm hearing the conversation outside the garage door. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm starting to see something. See, I'm, I've been awake for a fair while too. Yeah. So I'm like, psychosis. I don't really yeah. experience that that much, but maybe I am today. I don't know. <laughs> and, um, and I said to her, you know, I think they're out there, you know. And then she's kind of walked out. And by that time, I've I've jumped up into the roof, you know. And always I have a parcel, you know, I had a, a little little keep safe parcel of drugs, you know. And hopped up there, was just me and the drugs up in the roof. And, um, you know, and all I remember was, Closing the manhole, and by the time I close the manhole, bang the, you know, boom, you know, this is police, you know, and they're screaming, my sister's going off, and it was all crazy downstairs, and I'm trying to, you know, go back in, in the roof, in this section of roofing, and, and, like, trying to put away these drugs, you know, because, you know, if I, I knew, it's like a survival thing, you know, I'm putting away drugs, so I know I'm going to get locked up, I'm going to have something. And um, I remember trying to cover myself with the insulation in the roof, and, um, there and I'm trying to breathe and I, I'm like, you know, doing this, this thing and, and then um, the manhole, it opens. <laughs> and, and you see, you see, like what you see on the movies, you see uh, a torch and a gun and it, and it goes bang and it does that side and it drops. I'm like trying to hold my breath and, and, um, uh, and then I thought, wait, they're gone, you know, and, and I'm still oh, no. trying to put away these drugs and not be heard and blah, blah, blah. And um, then the manhole, boom, because it was like it was eight foot to get into this manhole and I kind of have superpowers when I'm on the run. So, I, you know, I got up there, but what happened, they lifted him up there and the manhole come over and he's, you know, he's gone boom and he's seen me. See, they're under the pressure and I have a gun. So that we're, we're talking, we've got a whole task force there. And, um, yeah, and I'm the kind of dude, if I, if I get done, I'm... I'm not, you know, F you please or anything. I'm just like, you got me, sweet, let's go, another drill. And I shuffled out to the manhole and, um, you know, he's screaming and yelling and blah, 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 you know. And um, all I remember is I got pulled out. I put one foot out of the manhole and I was ripped out of the manhole. And then I had like this out of body experience and it was kind of like a survival thing. So I got ripped out of the manhole, you know, into a crowd of D's and, and, and coppers, you know, from from about six or seven or whatever and, and just got peppered, you know, I just, they're, they're kicking me, they're, you know, laying boots into me, you know, and um, then I come back into my body <laughs> and I remember this certain day had me, you know, I was about 48 kilos, under 50 kilos, so I was pretty big and he had me by my throat up against the wall and he's, you know, screaming and yelling, where is it, you know, and, and um, strangling me and uh, yeah. I um, I had the the thing that went in my favour is I had the gun and the badge. They were the main things that they wanted. I still had them, but I had them buried an hour away. <laughs> but they didn't know that. I told them that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when they said, you know, like I said, I, I'm pretty easy going, and um, I just said, look, I, can, I got it, you know, and I'm bleeding, I've broken ribs and everything, you know, and um, and I remember when I got paraded out, um blood everywhere and everything and I walk out to this particular little this part where my sister lived and there was you know I think there was everything but a helicopter <laughs> you know and there was they were everywhere there was dogs there was you know and I walked out and I stood with these two coppers you know and everyone said was friends with this particular detective so they were pretty you know happy to see me and um, cut long story short went back they charged me um, they drove me down and this this ended up about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, but they drove me down and, you know, I'm at the back of this swamp handcuffed and I'm locating where, where I've buried the gun and the badge and everything, got that back and then, you know, I get back to the the police station, Newcastle police station and then it's morning, you know, I didn't sleep, you know, and I was, I was pretty upset because I, I dropped the drugs in the roof before they pulled me out, you know, and, um, and this is, this is, so this is how it happened. So this is how I ended up where I ended up. So I was battered, I was broken, I didn't have a missus anymore. My kids, you know, I was basically had nothing. And um, 
I was in I was in the cell and, and I knew a lot of the the officers, you know, um, by their first names, you know. And, and one officer he, he said to me, you know, he goes, Are "You going up for bail, guy?" You know, like, and I'm like, oh, "Chief, I'm not, I'm not doing it." You know, I'm just gonna stay here and chill. And he goes, "Mate, you you're better off just getting out of the cell," you know. And so I, you know, took his advice and I went up and seen seen me uh, solicitor and um, sit in this old box. And here's how this is how it works. You know, it's like when you know when you're ready. You know, when it when you're broken enough, certain things will appear. And um, I sit in this box, and the solicitor's there, and he goes, he's reading my name. He goes, "Is your father Greg?" I said, "Yeah." You know, and um, and he's like, "I know your dad. You know, he's he's this and he's that. He's great. You know, and and um, you know, and and he asked me, will he will he be there for you? Will he you know help?" Um, like, you know, as bail, I'm like, look, I'm not getting, you know, last time I appeared in front of the judge, he said to me, you come back to me with any type of charges, you know, especially breaking in or, you know, I'm doing three plus years, you know, and, um, but, uh, yeah, I went through it and he contacted my father, you know, and sort of told him what charges were and he said what he's going to go for, bail, you know, recommended rehab, you know, bail to your father, surety and all this type of stuff and I, and I didn't really have much hope, you know. And um, I think it was about an hour later, I, I went up to see the judge. And then the judge up on the stand reads the paperwork and he goes, Is your father God, uh, Greg? And same thing. And he's like, He had coffee with my dad the week before. You know, so it was kind of like the synchronicities. It was pretty amazing. And um, I got bail. <laughs> you know, and I got like, a, at that stage, I probably had about 180 charges around the same different wow. stuff. You know, and for someone of my, with my history to get bail, you know, it's pretty unheard of. And um, so, yeah, uh, I was bailed to rehab and um, that's where I went. And I faced, uh, I fronted up to this rehab and um, same staff that was still there two years prior. And they just see me there and I was just like, you know, you, you, you didn't take that suggestion, did you, about alcohol, mate? <laughs> you know, they were, yeah, I had a bit of sense of humor. And see the funny side of it, but um, all I knew is that when I presented to this rehab, you know, and I think that I think the thing that clicked with me was I was broken enough, you know, and out of being broken, become the willingness to actually maybe do something or consider, you know, to to do something. And um, but I can remember being on that little porch there and back in rehab, and um, yeah, that's when it just started opening right up, you know. But and you're in rehab straight. for how long? So this, that, the last time I went to rehab, so I'd done, completed the three month program and then I'd done the, the, the transition house that they were there. So I was in that rehab for just over five months, you know, and um, went through a lot of stuff. You know, I still had D's coming out, you know, because they were unhappy that I got bail. You know, they mm. were still trying to come out and coerce me and, you know, and basically trying to bait me how to, the ex-partner, you know, in psychosis, you know, telling the rehab that I'm stalking her and, you know, so there's all these different things that kind of, you know, like divine intervention, it kept me there. You know, when I had a thought, something dramatic happened, you know, or someone was introduced to me and, um, you know, I spent five months there and then I was guided to, to uh, come up to Newcastle, and which was appealing to me because I, I before I, I got in recovery, I, um, I robbed someone pretty important that was connected and, you know, there was kind of like, a bit of heat on my head, you know, and, and so I kind of needed to get out of that area, and um, yeah, I ended up in Newcastle, and I ended up in a halfway house, and I stayed there for around about five months, and then from there, the, the, it was just like doors just open. It's like if you back up and and you know you're willing enough and you listen, you know, you know the teacher the teacher will appear, you know, and um, and then I I stayed in, so I went to the halfway house, and then from there I spent about another. 18 months in my own recovery house. It was like this independent type of, you know, living that was provided, you know. And there's a story behind that because my dad was part of the funding for these houses and was, you know, I used to attend this, this halfway house that I went to in Newcastle when I was, you know, 10 or, or whatever it was as well. So it was all intertwined. Wow. Yeah. So then you, um, and like something that you said to me the other day that you and another... Yeah guy are the only ones that have survived yeah yeah like so all the people that you went through with and all that there's only the two of you left yeah 
that's yeah. just shades massive, of the percentage, isn't it? yeah. And yeah. that's what what I know. You know, they're either you know we don't hear of them. They're, they're not attending meetings, or you know we've heard, we've you know got news that they've died. You know, and that yeah. So that's, you've ended up back in that rehab centre as yep. a worker. Yeah, so... Far out. And yeah. I know we're going way, way over time, but it's just so interesting mm. to say that someone can get to that level and be that low yeah. that can make something of themselves <clears throat> and to help others in the same situation. Definitely. I just find that just absolutely amazing. You are one hell of a human. Thank you. You know, for doing... For just getting through it is enough, but... You know, to actually turn around your whole life around to now where you're helping people in that same situation. It's mm -hmm. very honourable. Yeah, thank you. Extremely honourable, yeah. I'm proud to have you here. Thank you. So, um, wow. If there was someone out there right now and they're watching this show and maybe they're in that situation where... They really don't know what to do. Like, they know they've got... Maybe they're questioning themselves about how much they're using or... You know, and you're never really honest about what you what your intake is. Yeah. You know, they might be just doubting the fact that they're even an addict. Yeah. What would you say to that person right now? What would be... Like, what is a message of hope for that person that you would share with that person right now? Yeah, look, I think um, I think just be open. Just be open that there are people out there that are willing to basically help you, you know, and um, just have a bit of faith, you know, and um, you're not alone, you know, and I think when, you know, the change occurs and when, you know, the help presents is when you're willing and open and, um, you know, I, I guess I'd just like to have a message that there is a lot of help out there, you know, and just reach out. Wow, so today, I mean, you're working in the industry. Yeah, so I've, I've gone, I've exited the rehab, you know, so I no longer work in that rehab. Um, but I, I've been guided, basically, to work with kids that are in out-of-home care, with their parent, parents that are addicts and, you know, alcoholics and all that type of stuff that I'm really familiar with, you know. And um, what I do know now is that, you know, I'm not, I'm not leading the ship, you know. I just kind of back up and... You know, whatever you want to call it, the universe, it, it just kind of leads the way, you know, and doors open and doors close, you know, and um, I'm forever learning. And, and you've and been clean growing. for, what, 10 years now? Yeah, so February this year, I'll be 10 years. Uh, wow. Next year, so, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I know everyone at home will be just clapping to that too because that is just amazing news and gives such great hope for others, you know, following in your footsteps. And I think, you know, like... Oh, I'm just honoured that you're here. And for me, it was such an eye-opener too to just to have the, your story told. Like, it's really quite an amazing story. Thank you. You know, and bless you for doing what you've done. I'm so, like I said, I'm just so proud to have shared the couch with you tonight. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and thanks to everyone too for, you know, staying there and listening and being a part of our show tonight. So I'm, I'm obviously I can't thank everyone tonight. So um, Nathan Errington, thank you. Janet Ryan, Todd Ranch, hey, thank you, Todd. Louise Melrose Hanley, Rebecca Vuri, Vuri, uh, Rowan Rain Retcher. Ra what's that? Oh look, let's go with that. That's yeah. I think Do you've think, done well. You know, yeah. I'm not very good at this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, and I can't see that well, so um, it's probably not that at all, but... You're close. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. well, what would you say it is? Come on. Raren... <laughs> Renee Retcher. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, <laughs> Renee Retcher. Okay. Yeah. All right. Rowan. Rowan. Rowan Renee Retcher. That might be it, but forgive me, please. I do not need any disrespect <laughs> at all. I'm sorry. Um, Chris Rourke. Colleen Dandelion. <laughs> Peter Harbelow, thank you, Peter. Sue Ellen Sloan, thank you, Sue Ellen. And, you know, for anyone that needs any help at all, like, please ring Lifeline. 13 11 14 13 11 14. Or have you got any numbers to add to that? 
No, not off the top of my head. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, just be in contact with me. There's, um, go to my website, onthecouchwithkelly.com. You can actually contact me through that. You can leave a message, um, inbox me here. So, you know, like any questions or anything like that, or if you're in need of help, any sort of assistance in that area. And you know what, look after yourself and know that no matter what in life, there are people out there that care about you. You've just got to reach out and talk to someone and that's what it's all about. It's about having that belief in yourself and knowing that you can change your life. And you know, no matter what in life, do not give up. Know that you're going to be okay. And I reckon that's a thumbs up for that. So know that you're going to be okay. Thank you everyone. And thanks Guy, Ali Ward. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone. Good night.